Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, my guest today is Jim Heppelman, CEO of PTC. Jim, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you, uh, Jacob, for giving me the chance. I'm uh, looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to the conversation as well. Um, so we have lots of um, fun and exciting things to talk about today. But to get started, why don't we dive into a little bit of background information about you? Because I read that you actually grew up on a uh, small dairy farm with seven siblings. Yeah, I did. Uh, I have, uh, believe it or not, six older sisters and uh, and one younger brother. And uh, I think that, you know, that experience shaped me in important ways. It certainly taught me the value of good hard work. Um, and it taught me all about machinery and, uh, you know, how things work and how to take them apart and put them back together and make them work again when they stop. And probably uh, that is in part why I became an engineer a mechanical engineer, actually. Uh, the second thing is uh, the second of my six older sisters became an engineer. And uh, when she graduated from college and got her first job, she already was making as much money as my parents were. Uh, and wow. I just said, oh, wow. You know, <laughs> that, that changes everything. So uh, certainly, you know, my uh, my decision to go into engineering, go to college, you know, go into technology really was a lot following one of my sisters who uh, paved the way and showed me the amazing possibilities that were out there for really anybody because I was coming from pretty modest means at the time. What were you doing on the dairy farm? What were your, uh, well, your goals? You know, uh, <laughs> what one does on a dairy farm, you know, bring the cattle in, feed them, clean up after them, uh, help with the milking, and then, uh, you know, run all the machinery. Uh, you got to cut, the, you know, plant the crops, cut the hay, build the hay, put the hay in the barn. Um, you know, uh, harvest the corn, you know, either chop it or pick it or whatever, put it in the silo. So it's a, it's a 365 day, you know, a year job. Yeah. Um, in the summer, it's 12, 14 hour days, you know, in the wintertime, it's maybe back to eight or 10 hour days, but it's a tremendous amount of work, which is why in that era, it was pretty typical for farmers to raise uh, large families because it was, you know, free labor, to be honest. So I'm, I'm, actually quite fascinated how you went from a dairy farmer to the CEO of a company with more than 6,000 employees. And how did, how did that transition look like? <laughs> well, uh, I went to, uh, I went to school to be an engineer. As I said, uh, you know, I was good with mechanical things and I happened to be quite good at math and science in high school. Uh, and I saw what my sister did and, you know, um, I, I was kind of looking for uh, that same opportunity. So I went to college and uh, when I was in college, I was very much attracted to computer science. And there was a program at the time uh, where you could be unclassified for a while. You didn't have to pick a major uh, right away at the university I went to. Mm -hmm. And then you could go visit uh, companies in the area and you know get educated about maybe what your major ought to be. So keep in mind, engineering brought me to college. But when I got there, I really fell in love with computer science. And then uh, I went to visit a very famous company. It was actually a 3M company. And uh, I remember I went and talked to uh, a manager there and I said, what do you think about engineering? What do you think about computer science? And this uh, manager said, oh, I wouldn't go into computer science. Um, <laughs> by the way, this is like uh, circa 19, I don't know, 82, 83. I wouldn't go into computer science because there's this new thing called a fourth generation language. And these four GLs, they write their own software and pretty soon we won't need software engineers. So I thought, well, that's pretty surprising, but okay, you know, this is, this is somebody at a famous company. They must know what they're talking about. It's the single, uh, in some ways, the single worst piece of advice I ever got, because of course, uh, from then until now, there was such a massive explosion of computer science and so forth. But what happened is when I went back to school, I said, okay, I'll do engineering, but what I'll do is uh, computer applications that support the engineering process, you know, computer aided design, uh, finite element simulation, things like that. So I actually studied right at that intersection of where software meets engineering. And of course, the, the company I'm CEO of today is a, is a company that produces software for engineers. So um, it actually, funny enough, landed me in a great spot where I learned a tremendous amount in school about engineering and a tremendous amount about computer science. And I use that every day. Uh, you know, to this day, I use that same yeah. learning along with uh, everything I learned at the School of Hard Knocks, of course. Um, and it's really helped me, I think, to be an effective CEO. I, I have some fundamental understanding of uh, what our customers are doing with our software. It's interesting that so this was around 82, 83, and literally this engineer at 3M said, do not go into the field of 
of coding, but it doesn't sound like you listened to him. Well, I, I, I backed halfway out. You know, my backup plan was to go back into mechanical engineering. So I said, I'll, I'll major in mechanical engineering, but, you know, I'll try to figure out how to bring software. So I kind of had more or less a dual major. Um, yeah. I, I respected what he had, but I didn't completely let it bind me. And uh, it's a good thing because, you know, I'm, a, I'm actually a much better computer scientist. I'm much more interested in it uh, yeah. than engineer. But I happen to understand the engineering domain a lot because I really did uh, study it quite extensively. I just find it so interesting that even in 82, 83, people were talking about computers that were going to, you know, take jobs away from humans. They were going to write themselves. But even in 82, 83, it sounds like he was quite wrong because, as you mentioned, we have, I mean, computer science is a massive, massive field with lots of demand. So he uh, clearly was incorrect in his, uh, in his mentioning that to you. Yeah, I often say it's probably the, the single worst piece of professional advice I ever got. Yeah. And I, I got it at a time when I was all ears and, and very, uh, you know, very influenceable. Um, and, and it all's well that ends well, so I don't have any complaints. But I look back and say he was so wrong. So yeah, wrong. He definitely was. For people who are not familiar with PTC, can you give some background information about the company? What do you guys do? How big are you? Yeah, we're a, a technical uh, software company. We produce... Uh, software that's used for engineering products, for manufacturing products, and for servicing products. Uh, we're about a billion and a half of revenue, uh, six and a half thousand employees, uh, $11 billion market cap, uh, global company. So we really have the who's who's uh, who's who manufacturers around the world, everybody from, you know, Toyota to Volkswagen, Raytheon, Airbus, you know, you name it. Uh, there's a pretty good chance they're a customer of ours. And we're, we're really, again, helping do engineering uh, manufacturing and then, you know, field service of, uh, of discrete products and other forms of, you know, manufactured goods. So large industrial software company. So what would be an example? Because it, it sounds like the average consumer wouldn't be interacting with your product, but for example, we would buy something from a company that uses your software to make the products. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm looking at my watch here. It, that was modeled, uh, engineered and manufactured with our software. I'm talking to you on a Lenovo ThinkPad that was uh, engineered and manufactured using our software. So you won't, so our software is not consumer based. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sold business to business, but uh, many of the products you'd see around you, you know, everything from planes, trains and automobiles to the uh, appliances in your uh, laundry room or your kitchen, to uh, consumer goods you interact with, there's a reasonably good chance that that product was uh, designed and then produced uh, using our software. And our software, depending on the nature of the product, might still be used to uh, to service and support it after the fact. So okay. good customers like uh, John Deere and Caterpillar, you know, uh, heating and air conditioning companies, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the aerospace and defense companies, Airbus, uh, you know, Toyota, Hyundai, uh, Volkswagen, yep. you know, BMW, they're all using our software in different ways, uh, you know, associated with the life cycle of their products. Okay, got it. And so as the CEO of a company that has around six, uh, six and a half thousand employees, what does a typical day look like for you? So maybe you can walk us through when you wake up in the morning to when you go to bed. How do you uh, structure your day? Yeah, well, uh, you know, there's uh, pre-COVID and, and then there's COVID timeframes. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that's going to surprise you is uh, I actually live on a farm uh, a little bit back to my days growing up. You know, I really appreciate that lifestyle and so forth. So uh, believe it or not, I live on a on a cattle ranch, uh, not too far from Boston here, kind of in the Boston suburbs. So uh, part of my release in the morning is I, I get up and I go take care of my animals, make sure everybody's OK and fed and, you know, uh, all taken care of. Uh, that's very relaxing to me. That's probably what my time are you up in the morning. Yeah, you know, I generally get up by six, between 5.30 okay. and six. Uh, I'm out doing that. And then, uh, you know, normally uh, I might work out and then head into the office. Uh, of course, in COVID times, there's uh, generally, I've kind of missed that head into the office part. And I just yeah. uh, walk into the office at home or uh, walk out onto the patio if it's a nice day and, and start my day there. But, um, you know, then uh, when the day's over, I try to get back home. I tend to make dinner, believe it or not. I'm the cook in the family. Um, wow. So it's a, kind of unusual. I, that's okay. Everybody's their own person. And, you know, I, I uh, have set my life up uh, the way I like it and the way my wife and my daughter like it. So, uh, 
everybody's generally happy. Um, <laughs> but of course, uh, I travel a lot too in normal times, but in COVID times, uh, like everybody else, I haven't been traveling at all, which is, uh, yeah. it's nice, but I'm starting to miss it. And when you are typically in the office again, uh, you know, pre pre COVID times, uh, what does your day look like while you're actually at work? Are you just back to back meetings or do you have certain ways that you structure your day uh, as the CEO? Well, I, I tend to be in back to back meetings, but I would put them in a couple of different categories. Uh, one is customer visits. So uh, mm -hmm. at our headquarters, we host a lot of companies who are coming in and spending a day with us. And and on a typical day, there's three, four or five different companies here visiting. So uh, okay. I get a lot of energy out of the customer interaction. You know, what are you trying to do? Um, how can we help? Uh, do you have any feedback on our software if you're using it? And trust me, they always do. Uh, and then there's a lot of internal meetings, but I'm pretty well booked uh, all day long. And, you know, uh, I don't mind that as long as it's interesting dialogue. I'm I'm really still a technology guy. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not a bean counter. I, I'm, I'm not the, the uh, head of operations. I'm, I'm really more the vision guy, the technology guy. I'm trying to work with our engineers on the next generations of products they're building. I'm trying to work with our customers on uh, where the company's going and the vision we have for the company. And that stuff's very uh, energizing for me. Of course, I have to review all the financial models and stuff like that. That's a little less energizing, yeah. but uh, but necessary. But I really, I really get a lot of energy from the uh, the technical work, which is kind of mm -hmm. my background. What does a, a CEO actually do? Because a lot of people assume that the CEO just kind of sits at the very top of the company. They kind of just tell everybody else what to do. They sit in their beautiful corner office. And that's the perception that a lot of people have of, of what a CEO or maybe even any top executive uh, yeah. looks like or what they do. Um, what is, you know, if, if we were to kind of peel that back and give, you know, the, the real life of the CEO, the real life of a leader inside of a company like PDC, uh, what does the CEO actually do? What are you responsible for? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't want this to sound derogatory in any way, but maybe I'm responsible for herding cats. Because uh, there's a lot of people, there are a lot of initiatives, a lot of programs, a big organization, and I'm trying to keep uh, all of that moving in the right direction generally. So I'm not doing the precise tweaks, but to try to keep everybody understanding where we're going and uh, and make sure they're moving in that direction and they're moving at the right pace so that you know it all comes together uh, each quarter when we're delivering products or projects or uh, trying to make the quarter quarterly results happen. Um, so I'd say a lot of my meetings are just checking in with people. Hey, what are you working on? How's it going? Um, have you solved this particular problem? Have you thought of this or tried that? You know, uh, to just keep keep the finance people moving in the right direction. All the different product lines, you know, the sales, the services organizations. It's really uh, a lot of kind of influence, and you know, you don't really tell them what to do. You kind of check in and make suggestions and and try to guide people maybe more than uh, than direct them. And I, I think it it takes a, a fair amount of energy um, and it takes a lot of interaction with people on an ongoing basis. And of course, there's a lot of people to interact with when you're the CEO. Do you also uh, try to make some time for yourself? Because you mentioned that you're kind of like the vision guy, you think of ideas, but obviously if you're just in back-to-back -back meetings all the time, it's very hard to kind of like sit down and think. So do you make it a habit to give yourself just some time every day to kind of explore ideas and uh, I, I, I tend to do that more in the evening you know dinner's over i cleaned up spent some time with the family uh my wife's off reading the book my daughter's doing her homework and i'm uh, i'm out exploring technology hmm. and then uh, i don't know how to say this but i have a gift actually and that is i dream about things hmm. and i wake up much smarter than when i went to bed i i frequently wake up with some new idea or or some new tactic to try to solve a problem and a lot of times I don't even consciously dream of it, but I wake up and I realize I really thought that whole problem through while I was sleeping. And uh, now I can, I can see some path forward. And again, I call it a gift because I don't try to do that, but um, it's, it's really given me some great ideas over the years. So how do you balance that though? Because I would imagine that if you, if you go to sleep and sometimes, you know, you, you wake up and you have this like epiphany of this great idea, um, Sometimes it can be very challenging, I'm, I'm assuming, for your team. It's like, oh, you know, Jim went to bed. He, he's got another uh, idea he's bringing into the office. How do you balance the kind of the dream versus the, the practicality, the reality of it? Well, uh, you know, it's funny that you say that, uh, Jacob, because um, there is sometimes a joke here that about the time Jim's getting bored with something, it really starts to work. Um, <laughs> and, and maybe it's because, uh, you know, my attention span isn't that long. So I try yeah. to be patient. 
But I'd also tell you, uh, having a CEO who's a little impatient and, and let's say without a super long attention span, I think it's a good thing. You know, I've been CEO for 10 years now. And the biggest problem with CEOs at my level of tenure is they just become entrenched in old thinkings. You know, yeah. they made some decision five years ago or maybe even eight years ago. And uh, for a couple of years, they improved it a little bit. And then they've just spent the last five years telling everybody why it works and we're not going to change it. And I'm a little bit of a, of a different cut. Uh, I say, hey, we did this. We improved it. It's working. But we got to think about what's next. And, and let's not wait until it's not working to think about what's next. Let's some of us start thinking about what we're going to do next, even while this is still working pretty well. And that's why I joke that, you know, sometimes people say, uh, you know, he's getting bored. So it's really going to start working. And it really means that, you know, it's starting to stabilize and I'm starting to think about what's next because my personality just uh, doesn't have the patience to just ride success. I'm, I'm always looking for uh, the next round of changes that would, you know, make us even better or perhaps uh, protect us from some new threat that's headed our way, you know, technology disruption or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's a good quality, actually, in a CEO. So I, I two two questions based on what you said. Uh, one is going back a couple of minutes. You said that you're obviously in a lot of meetings and you're checking in with people. Do you have a certain way that you structure your meetings or a series of questions that you ask? Or is it just kind of like, hey, how's it going? Tell me what's what's up. Or, or is it a little bit more kind of... Um, I don't know, planned out than that. Yeah, I, I don't overstructure it. I think they generally have uh, they have a similar flow, which is uh, I, I ask people, you know, to uh, get on my agenda and take me through something they're doing. And, you know, as they take me through it, I'm typically doing a little bit of the Columbo thing. You know, I'm asking questions and uh, and sometimes even the questions start to reveal a little bit the direction I'm steering them in. Um, so I, I, I really try to do like, tell me what you're doing and let me let me ask about it and throw out some ideas as the discussion starts to become a little bit more ad hoc and so forth. And then maybe try to get some consensus as we're wrapping up about, you know, where we ought to take this next, uh, what are kind of the action items coming out of the meeting that uh, we ought to go pursue and so forth. Hmm. So it, is, it doesn't sound like you specifically tell people what to do all the time. You kind of let them come to their um, come to their conclusions based on the questions that you're asking. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's an important CEO quality. Yeah. I think uh, I think a CEO has tremendous power, but almost uh, you dare not use it very frequently um, mm -hmm. because it, it does not it, it does not enfranchise people well. Um, it leaves them frustrated and angry and so forth. So I think it's a much better uh, way to try to collaborate towards some common understanding that can be action than to just tell people what the answer is and end the meeting early. Yeah, makes sense. You know, I have to say, for for a CEO of a six thousand plus uh, plus person company, you seem very uh, relaxed and and happy and not stressed out. You're you're up in the morning taking care of animals. You're cooking dinner. I've talked to some business leaders where they cannot find enough hours in the day to do what they need to get done. And so I'm really curious: is is work is this balance of making sure that you can spend time with family, that you have a life outside of work, an important element for you that you purposely kind of designed? Yeah, for sure. I think you need some uh, mental relief. And, and I would tell you, maybe I learned along the way. Uh, when I first became CEO, I, I really stuck my nose into everything very deeply. And uh, I was burning the candle at both ends and I was getting very, very stressed. And then, uh, you know, I sat down with the chairman a couple of times and talked through how it was going. And, uh, you know, he and I both agreed that what I should do is focus my energy where I really bring a lot of value to the table. Again, which tends to be around product strategies, uh, marketing strategies, uh, marketing messages, uh, competitive uh, strategies and so forth. And, you know, let somebody else um, manage the financial plan, let somebody else manage the professional services margins, yep. things like that, because uh, I don't need to do that and I don't bring a tremendous quality uh, to it. You know, nothing super unique or special. And uh, at the end of the day, you got to pick your battles. There's just not enough time for a CEO to be in charge of everything. Yeah. So uh, I, I got a lot happier after I realized I should roll with the punches and uh, just really add value where I think I have the most value to add. That's actually great advice because I know for leaders, especially for new leaders, that can be a big challenge for them. You, you tend to just put yourself in all the different buckets, all the cookie jars, and you get burned out and stressed out and you can't be a great leader. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it sounds like- time there was a time, Jacob, when our board used to say, Jim, you don't have to answer every question we ask. 
you know, because I really? no matter no matter what question they answered they asked, you know, I jumped in with the answer and they were like, just just you know, let the team shine through a little more. And and that's really when I when I kind of reconfigured the way I thought about mm-hmm. my day. And uh I've been happier and frankly the company's done better. So uh I think it was a good move. Very cool. You also mentioned this idea of challenging entrenched thinking, which is something that a lot of people struggle with, not necessarily themselves, but they work with people who they believe are stuck in entrenched thinking and they're trying to get them to break free. Obviously, as a CEO, you can just kind of say, all right, we're not doing that anymore. Um, But for people who work with others, they're not in a CEO position. How do you get people to break out of their entrenched thinking? Yeah, I mean, uh, let me let me share my experience here first. Uh, when I became CEO, uh, you know, the company hadn't been doing that well, and I was a new CEO. I was a first time CEO, and and so I basically said, I'm not going to keep doing what my predecessor did because, frankly, it didn't work that well. So yeah. I had to try some new ideas and I had to make some changes. And some changes were fairly obvious, you know, things that uh, kind of had a no fly zone under the previous administration. And I was saying, no, we're going to go make we're going to go make some changes there. Um, and so what I realized early on, though, is that uh, people don't like to change. And yep. so uh, many times, you know, I would say, OK, we're going to change. We're going to take a left turn and we're going to do all this stuff. And then, uh, you know, some weeks or months into it, I look back and say, where's everybody? I mean, they're still back doing what they used to do. And I realized that humans, as I said, don't like to change. It's really a problem of inertia. You know, a body in motion wants to continue in yeah. motion at the same vector and velocity. Um, and and the only way you can overcome uh, inertia is to apply a force. And uh, the best sort of force is is a positive force. You know, instead of uh, yelling at people or whatever, try to inspire them. Uh, you know, to try something different. So, part of what I did is I set out to change the culture of the company. And job number one was to create a culture that liked change. I mean, to the extent humans could ever like change. But uh, so we we did many things. Uh, we, we adopted some slogans, you know, take a fresh look. Man, I don't I don't know what you do. I don't care what you do. But every once in a while, call a timeout, step back, look around the industry, compare what you're doing to everybody else, and just make sure that what you're doing is still the best way to do it. That's what take a fresh look meant. Then uh, at one point I had, uh, you know, we had gone through some change and and I realized Certain employees were saying, hey, Jim, you wanted us to change. We did change. Now leave us alone. And then uh, that led to a a thing uh, from a place to a pace, which I said, we're not trying to change from this place to that place. We're trying to change from this place to that pace, to that company who changes all the time. You can't pin them down because they're too busy changing. So uh, this certainly was a lot of effort uh, put into change, celebrating change. You know, uh, we used to kick off our quarterly employee meetings by uh, celebrating tenure. You know, people have been here 20 years, 25 years, whatever. And uh, I said, we should change that. We should uh, recognize people who stepped out, took that fresh look and did something different. And so we started celebrating what we call change makers. And and then that led to a whole series of uh, employee recognition programs and so forth around really celebrating somebody who did something surprising and uh, Sometimes even if it didn't work, hey, at least you tried. You 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 recognized yeah. the problem, you challenged it, and you went after it. And so uh, I think that did change the culture. And then, you know, as we made more changes, uh, actually the performance of the company was better, and then it became a little bit self-reinforcing. And so now I think we work in a company that really, you know, is afraid to stand still. And, uh, of course, if you're going to be in some of the fields, some of the tech fields that we're in, you, you don't dare stand still because the whole field is moving so fast. So yeah. I think – I think we found our way to a to a good place with a culture that really uh, sort of pulls on change almost at this point. So it sounds like if I were to um, kind of deconstruct the, the elements that made the change happen, it sounds like one of the, the crucial elements is you have to make it just kind of a part of the company branding. I mean, you mentioned you uh, you added those those taglines, those values. So you made it kind of ingrained into what the what the company stands for. It sounds like that's a crucial step. Yep. Okay. Um, and then the, the second, it sounds like you were doing, you were leading by example. I mean, you were, you know, living what you wanted other people to, to do. Yep. Um, and then the third, uh, you mentioned uh, doing it in a positive way. So not screaming at people, not yelling at people, but kind of encouraging them and, and helping and, them understand. And celebrating all the successes and, you know, um, even celebrating the failures where there was a, yeah. a real attempt to try to solve a difficult problem in a new okay. way. 
Uh, anything else besides those three criteria that you think were effective or is that kind of a good summary of those? That's a, that's a pretty good summary. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to also go back to something else that you mentioned earlier before we jump into some of the uh, more work-related stuff. You mentioned that you also learned a lot from the School of Hard Knocks. And so, <laughs> so what, is, what does that mean? Well, uh, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've worked for companies along the way that have struggled mightily. Uh, some of them more or less going out of business. Um, and, uh, and, and even, you know, I was acquired into PTC. I, I skipped that part, but I had started a company and PTC acquired it. And uh, when I came in, uh, PTC itself had many problems. But of course, the business I brought in was doing quite well. And I, I hung around and I took the attitude that uh, there's a lot of goodness here to work with. We just got to solve the problems. And we shouldn't run away from the problems. We shouldn't quit. Uh, you know, shouldn't go find another job. We should try to solve these problems because I think they're solvable. And so uh, I've worked in a lot of companies during periods when they weren't doing well at all. Hmm. And uh, I didn't run away from it. I, I've always taken the attitude that um, a problem is an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, inside every problem you solve is an opportunity to do better. And, uh, you know, I'd hate for work. I'd hate almost to work for a company that didn't have any problems because I'm not sure what we would do every day. Yeah. Right. Uh, because these are the opportunities we're going after. So um, I just think that learning persistence around don't run away from problems, don't be afraid of them, uh, own them, look for creative solutions, think of them as opportunities. Uh, you know, one of the things I say to my colleagues is there's a reason we call it work. You know, if all we did was fun things all day long, we'd call it play. But we yeah. call it work because we come to work to solve problems, to create value. And let's not be afraid to do that. And let's not be down about it. Let's uh, let's be excited if we see a problem and we think there's a solution there because, uh, you know, it's going to add to the share prices, the growth, the profit, whatever it takes uh, when we solve that problem. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. Um, okay. So we talked a little bit about that. So it sounds like the, the hard knocks for you is you went through, you were a part of organizations that were going through some tough times. Yeah. Um, do you have a, a story that comes to mind of uh, um, maybe when when you when you got a black eye or a bruised ego uh, through one of these organizations? Did anybody ever ever yell at you or put you down? Have any bad leaders? Uh, any, anything pop into mind? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there was a uh, one one of the earlier CEOs of PTC uh, took me to task one time because uh, you know he he asked me basically asked me for a miracle, put me in charge of delivering a miracle, and and I said. Ah, I don't think that could be done, but I'm sure going to try. And and I tried, and we failed. And he looked mad, you know, he looked bad, and he was angry. And uh, and he took me to task. And it's probably the closest I ever came to leaving because I said, "Hey, I'll, I'll put up with a lot of crap, but I don't want to get beat up because I delivered a good result that wasn't a miraculous result, right? Um, that's that's not worth doing. But um, fortunately, uh, the board intervened, and uh, I stayed, and he left. So. Yeah. Uh, it ended well. <laughs> well, it's actually interesting because it sounds like you, uh, and I feel like a lot of employees sometimes have a hard time with this, uh, kind of standing up for themselves sometimes, especially when it's to somebody who's more senior. And I don't suppose, uh, I don't know if you have any advice for that, but if you do have a leader who's asking something of you that is maybe not attainable or not possible, and you know you're kind of going into a situation where there's just no way that you can come out looking good on the other end, what do you do? I mean, can you, you know, do you talk sense into the leader? I mean, like, how do you manage that relationship if that happens? Yeah. Uh, you know, some of my military friends uh, characterize this as uh, speaking truth to power. Yeah. Uh, they have the power, you have the truth. And and you have to say it. You have to say, uh, that's not possible. You know, I'm, I'm going to try. Uh, I'll, I'll try to do practically anything, but you can't ask me to do something that can't be done or can't practically be done. Yeah. Um, because we know how the story is going to end. And uh, that's a little bit what happened in this situation is I was, I was asked to do something that was virtually impossible, you know, in terms of business results. Yeah. Um, and, and while we had pretty amazing business results, they weren't the, they weren't the miracle I was asked for. So I think you do have to speak truth to power. And if, uh, if the power is going to be, you know, uh, entrenched in its ridiculous views, then, then it is time to leave. Okay, good. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit and just get your general perspective perspective on uh, workforce trends that you're paying attention to. So there's obviously a lot that's happening in the world of work. I know that you have written and talked a lot about technology and specifically augmented reality. Um, so we can touch on on why you think that's so crucial. 
But first, the big picture, when you look at just workforce trends in general, what, what are you paying attention to? Well, I think uh, digitization in all forms is what we've learned from COVID. You know, things that yep. uh, could be done digitally have continued forward and things that couldn't be done digitally have kind of ground to a halt. And uh, maybe if I could just segue from that, you know, when I look at the global workforce and, and I'm thinking both about people and about business opportunity for PTC here, uh, about three quarters of the people in the world are what you would characterize as frontline workers. They're yeah. out there in the world. They're using their hands and feet. They're, they're doing things in the physical world that can't be done on computers. And then the other roughly one quarter really are sitting behind a computer all day. And uh, digital has done amazing things for knowledge workers who sit behind a computer all day. Because if you sit behind a computer, well, it doesn't matter if the computer's in the office or computer's at home, you get a lot of work done. But if you're somebody who goes out in the physical world and now you're not allowed to, or your support infrastructure isn't there, uh, then suddenly you have a big problem. You know, you're either laid off or, or you're uh, unproductive or what have you. So I'm looking for ways to take digital from the realm of knowledge workers, not to take it away from them, but to expand it over to the realm of uh, frontline workers. And again, in order to do that, we have to take computing off the computer screen and put it in the real world. And that's what augmented reality is. It's augmenting the real world with digital information. So now people that work in that real world can get uh, digital information as they work and can be guided uh, with that information in very powerful ways that uh, makes them more productive, they make fewer mistakes, and uh, it really just kind of unleashes more of the human potential that everybody has. Do you have any examples of how that's uh, being used or where you even see this going in the future, maybe the next five, 10 years? Yeah, let me uh, let me start with sort of an abstract example and then uh, maybe apply it a little bit more. So, so first of all, um, I like to think of augmented reality is a technology that takes digital information, let's call it bits and bytes, and it turns it into sounds and sights that appear in the physical world. Mm -hmm. So a, an augmented reality device like a HoloLens or even a phone or a tablet converts bits and bytes, which a human doesn't understand, to sounds and sights, which we do understand. We have senses for that. Uh, and then vice versa, it, it converts sounds and sights back to bits and bytes. So to me, uh, an augmented reality device, let's think of a HoloLens, is like a modem that converts from digital protocols to human protocols and allows that information to flow seamlessly in both directions. So. Let me give you kind of a fun example, and then I'll get to more realistic examples. Let's say um, I wanted to uh, play chess, and I wanted to play a, a, amongst the best chess masters in the world. And I'm going to focus on this guy, uh, Gary Kasparov. He's First a of really all, great. I, do you know that I am obsessed with chess, or is this purely no. coincidental? <laughs> it's purely coincidental. You see the chessboard behind me? Uh, yes, I do, actually. On the, on the I, I take chess lessons from a grandmaster. Yeah. So Okay, so, so maybe I this is. This I love where this is going. So uh, now I'm not that good at chess. I just never applied myself enough to it. And it takes a long time to learn, right? Yeah. So if I wanted to be able to play with the great chess masters, I'd have to study this for many, many years because I have to keep it all in my head, all the patterns and algorithms and, uh, you know, experiences. I have to remember all this and it has to become innate almost. Uh, now, meanwhile, IBM came up with this computer, you know, a decade or more ago called uh, Deep Blue that if Gary agrees to play on the keyboard, Deep Blue can regularly beat him now, okay? But Gary has to play on the computer, like a knowledge worker. Uh, so how about if I take a HoloLens and I agree, I'll meet Gary at any uh, Starbucks you want, Gary. Just tell me where and when and I'll show up and I'm gonna put on that HoloLens and that HoloLens is gonna be connected to Deep Blue. And th even though I don't really know how to play chess, all I'm really gonna do is action the information that Deep Blue is giving me. Move this piece to this square, move this piece to that square. And I'm gonna start beating Gary on a regular basis. And people are gonna say, you're a tremendous chess player. I'm gonna say, no, actually, I don't even know how to play. I was just collaborating with that AI machine in the cloud that was giving me information just when I needed it. And I didn't study chess at all. I just kind of actioned that information that was supplied to me just in time and in the context of the chess game in the Starbucks I'm, uh, I'm in right now. So um, augmented reality is a way to replace the whole learning process and take it from in advance, just in case, 
learning, which is what we've all had, to uh, just in time, in full context, information being supplied to you. And that just unlocks incredible superpowers for people because suddenly they can do so many things because they can be guided with information in the moment and never having studied or mastered that stuff in advance. So it, to me, is an incredible technology. Now, I'm not really trying to solve the chess problem. I'm trying to make uh, industrial companies more efficient. And so they have workers uh, in factories trying to you know, do parts of the production process. They have uh, workers out at the customer site installing and setting up uh, you know, installations of equipment or, or whatever the product is. And they have uh, people on service calls trying to keep the machines uh, running and uh, tuned and you know, replace spare parts and so forth. And we can deliver so much information to those people using augmented reality. And again, we can actually make humans so much more productive. Did you even start thinking about, does automation make as much sense as it used to? You know, we used to say humans aren't productive, let's, let's replace them with robots. But you know, robots have huge setup times and humans have very short setup times, but humans lack the knowledge of what to do. So if we could give them the knowledge, take advantage of their short setup times, like I'll meet you at any Starbucks you want, doesn't take long. Uh, it's a powerful combination of the best of human and the best of digital working together in a collaborative way using augmented reality. Hmm. Well, you know, um, so augmented reality has obviously been around, well, talked about for a while. Um, and then you know, there's a lot of hype around it, a lot of excitement around it. It feels like it kind of plateaued. Maybe it went down a little bit. Now it's kind of picking back up. Where do you think we are kind of in the augmented reality scope like how long would it take before this becomes mainstream i know there are a couple of companies sort of experimenting with it but where where do you think we are on that time horizon yeah well let me first tell you we at ptc have thousands of industrial customers using augmented reality today in various stages i mean they're all fairly early but uh the big thing to me is you need that device that acts as your modem that can mm -hmm. see the same world you see and convert digital information into things you see and hear um, so, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the HoloLens, but what's democratized it incredibly is the phones and tablets we have and the incredible cameras they now have. So um, I think augmented reality now runs pretty darn well on phones. Um, the only shortcoming is it ties up your hands. So yeah. if you got a wrench in one hand and a part in the other, who's going to hold the phone for you? Yeah. Um, and that's really to me where, okay, a HoloLens is kind of like a wearable phone that, that I can see the same information while holding the part in the wrench. Um, mm. Now, I think we're on the brink of uh, wearable devices getting a lot better. Uh, you know, the HoloLens 2 is much, much better than the HoloLens 1. Uh, you know, uh, various different companies are, are, in fact, there's a lot of companies working on uh, even the next generation yet of uh, wearables. You know, Apple's rumored to be working on it. Google, of course, has had Google Glass and they yep. keep keep working on the next uh, iterations. Magic Leap has something. There's a number of Chinese companies working on it. Uh, so I think I think we're on the precipice of there being uh, wearable devices that feel like a pair of reading glasses or sunglasses but then deliver all this digital information just in time in full context. And uh, you know what we're trying to do at PTC is have all the software ready because those devices won't mean much if we don't have the software and the data. So we're using uh, phones and tablets in a lot of cases to prepare the information, but we'd rather deliver it on, uh, on wearable devices. I think yeah. the next two to three years, we're going to see a, a, a big spike in uh, you know, advancement of wearable devices. So for the wearable devices or for augmented reality, is this something that you mainly just see for people who, as you mentioned, are frontline workers, or are there any applications of this for people who do work behind a computer or a screen? Well, um, you know, the problem I'm focused on, I mean, I think augmented reality can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. It obviously can mean a lot to, to consumers, but the problem I'm focused on is, uh, how to make humans more productive, uh, you know, in my customers, which are Got really it. those Got global uh, manufacturing companies. But okay. let me say, you know, frontline workers are also in hospitals, they're doing surgery, they're nurses and doctors, um, you know, they're in stores, they're in warehouses. So there's lots of different applications of this technology. I think, mm -hmm. you know, knowledge workers can also use AR, but meanwhile, they have something. And the problem is frontline workers don't have anything. So, yep. uh, I think that augmented reality gives frontline workers the equivalent to Zoom, 
because instead of having a meeting like you and I are having right now where we see each other on the computer screen, uh, you can bring information into the physical world around me and actually decorate dynamically in a, in a conversation, decorate the world and say, see this part, Jim, that's the one that you've got to replace. And I say, okay, I understand because you marked on the actual part on the machine, crystal clear what you want me to do. And you're talking to me in the meantime. If you mark on your screen, that doesn't do any good because when I'm looking at your screen and I turn and look at the machine, I don't get it. You know, I can't make that map. Yeah. But if but if I'm using if I'm using my phone to look through the phone at the machine and I see you marked up on the machine while we're talking, okay, that's clear. So uh, AR is the equivalent to Zoom or Teams or WebEx or whatever. Uh, AR is also the equivalent to uh, YouTube. You could mm -hmm. make a YouTube video showing me how to do something. And again, it's good because I can study the video and study what you did, but the setting's always wrong. You know, maybe you're yeah. explaining to me how to make bread, but you made it in your kitchen and my kitchen's not like that. So what AR does is it separates the foreground from the background and then sort of repins the foreground, the information in the background you're in. So it'd be like you explaining how you make bread, but you're explaining it in my kitchen. Oh, wow. That's incredible. But again, through augmented reality. And then publishing too, you know, uh, all the all the stuff, all the technical documentation we publish in PDF could again be published instead in the real world, instead of on 2D paper, you know, on the on the 3D world. Come over here, look here, do this. Okay, now come over here, uh, you know, look here, do that. Uh, we can do that all with augmented reality. So I, I sort of say AR gives us the equivalent of Zoom, YouTube, and PDF, but in the real world. And that's an incredible breakthrough that, you know, literally billions of people can benefit from around the world. So I'm yeah, very excited about that. Fascinating for sure. Uh, okay. So besides augmented reality, what are some of the other broader workforce trends that you are paying attention to? Uh, so um, others, uh, you know, would be uh, remote work, remote monitoring, remote diagnostics. So you may know we have a big uh, business in uh, Internet of Things. And let me again qualify that maybe as industrial Internet of Things. But, uh, for example, all these medical device manufacturers have all this equipment around the world right now that's working feverishly trying to come up with a vaccine. But, you know, that equipment has to be monitored. And, uh, and, and sometimes uh, there needs to be an intervention either to add new uh, consumable products to it or, or perhaps it's drifting out of spec or, or whatever. We can manage that now uh, remotely by uh, using Internet of Things to collect sensor streams and to analyze what's going on and apply some AI and machine learning and, and then cause an alert to happen. And, and maybe I either log in remotely and tweak the machine or else perhaps using AR, I call on somebody who's near the machine and ask them to uh, intervene with maybe some of my guidance delivered through, uh, through AR. So I think the whole notion of separation and then... Uh, if you take those two ideas and put them together with uh, with other ideas, you get what I call spatial computing or what we call spatial computing. Spatial computing basically says you have a 3D replica of a worksite, uh, you know, digitally, and you have an understanding digitally of what the machines or assets and what the workers are doing. This could be a hospital. It could be a grocery store. It could be a warehouse. It could be a factory. And you're now able to virtually uh, interact with the digital twin and have those interactions passed back into the real world. And, and of course, the real world reaction to those interactions uh, captured again the digital twin. So it's just virtualizing everything, but in a real time, hyper realistic way. So I can go walk the halls of a factory uh, from my office at home. And when I'm done walking the halls of that factory, I'll go walk the halls of the next one as if I were there seeing what's really happening but yeah. also seeing the data and being able to interact with the machines and the workers using IoT and, uh, and AR technologies. So oh, I think man. virtualization of work is a, is a huge deal that will uh, get a great acceleration because of COVID, but it's an idea that was coming anyway, and COVID is just a big uh, acceleration of this idea. Yeah, that's fascinating stuff. Uh, I know that you've also talked about things like the aging workforce, skills gap, uh, things like that. So what, where do you stand on that? Maybe we can start with the, the skills gap. W would stuff like yeah. augmented reality help close that? And how yeah, big sure. is the gap now? For sure. And, uh, you know, particular here in the U.S., I'd say other Western countries uh, have the same problem. But here in the U.S., uh, the demographics have changed. 
such that we no longer have a lot of those frontline workers, particularly in the industrial world. Uh, people didn't go into this line of work because it felt like it was going to China. And in many cases it was, um, and it wasn't cool enough and so forth. So uh, right now, if you go and tour factories of great American manufacturers, you see a lot of fairly older people in there and they're all moving toward retirement and they're having trouble finding people to come in and backfill them. And there's kind of two problems. One is getting somebody to take that job. But the second one is trying to transfer 40 years of knowledge from the person who's about to retire to the newbie who's uh, who's going to supplant them. And uh, so AR can play, a, can play a huge role because for example, we can capture the expertise of the uh, retiring worker, that kind of AR uh, YouTube idea. We can capture that expertise, store it. And when a new worker shows up through a HoloLens or a, or a phone or tablet, actually redeploy that coaching that's been digitized into the physical environment for the benefit of the new worker. So the new worker can be coached in the actual environment by somebody who retired two years ago. It's just a very powerful idea. And uh, yeah. in the US, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers um, is tracking the workforce shortage. And they say that in the manufacturing world, this is the, the US manufacturing organization, says that uh, over the next 10 years, we'll have a shortage of 2.8 million frontline workers in the wow. manufacturing uh, it's universe. It's crazy. It is crazy. And in fact, you know, some of the things that are happening in the world actually threaten to make that worse. You know, there's suddenly a huge amount of reshoring discussion happening. Maybe we should bring our production back from China or, or Asia or whatever and bring it back to the U.S. You say, okay, great idea. Uh, we, we, we can sidestep those trade wars and, and maybe get some safety from supply chain disruptions like we saw last year. But how do I find these workers? How do I convince them it's interesting work? And then how do I train them and make them productive? And a lot of companies think the answer to that's augmented reality. Because again, it allows you to capture uh, experience as bits and bytes and then inject that experience into a worker's frontline work environment as sounds and sights uh, at the appropriate time. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, it really is. Uh, so you mentioned uh, you were talking a little bit about talent. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, what, what do you do? What does PTC do as a company to attract and retain top talent? What is it like to work there? Yeah, um, well, I think uh, part of its culture, uh, part of its work, uh, obviously some of its compensation, part of its location. So, uh, you know, uh, again, I, I got to think pre-COVID and post-COVID because I think this will change it. But uh you know, we moved our headquarters actually uh, down to a very exciting area in Boston here. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, in my little conference room right now at the headquarters. Uh, we came here because, uh, you know, the workforce we want to hire uh, tends to be younger, as you would expect. Uh, fresh out of college, full of good ideas, especially uh, cutting edge ideas around things like uh, AR and spatial computing and IoT and AI. Yeah. They don't want to work in the suburbs. We used to have a big campus in the woods on a lake in the suburbs. And, you know, I quite liked it, but I realized the new workers don't like it at all. They say, Jim, I don't own a car and I don't want to buy one. And I can't easily get here mm. with mass transit. So I don't like this job. So I think uh, location is part of it. Culture, obviously, you know, you, you have to have an environment that has purpose and, and there has to be some, uh, you know, attractive elements uh, of the culture overall. I think the work you do. You know, people are picky. Uh, uh, the best people really want to build their careers and they want to build their careers around exciting cutting edge technology. So I think uh, it's a lot easier for us to hire like the best and brightest out of MIT, for example, into uh, our augmented reality technology rather than maybe into some of our older uh, technologies that are 20 years old or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, obviously compensation. People are looking to, you know, get paid and do well and yep. get going on their career. So I think, you know, um, I've been in situations where I didn't have any of those elements and, and now I have a few of them working in my favor and it's uh, it's been great. L let me just say, I think COVID changes it because if we're going to work from home a lot more, then that's going to be a different consideration. Um, although I think, uh, I think we'll end up at some place that's halfway between where we used to be and where we are now in terms of uh, when do I work in the office, when do I work from home? That was actually going to be my next question is, uh, so as a result of COVID, and there's been a lot of 
debate on this. So I, I live in the Bay Area, for example, and some people are saying, oh, you know, the Bay Area is going to get crushed. Nobody's going to work at companies in the Bay Area. People are saying the same thing about New York. Um, and what's your thought on this? Do you think after we get through COVID, things will get back into being in the office? Or are we seeing like permanent long-term change, the, the destruction of headquarters and these, these big cities where everybody used to work? Yeah, I, I think we'll get, we're going to go roughly halfway back to where we used to be. Um, and I say that because, you know, when, when COVID started, I got sent home, everybody got sent home. Uh, and we were amazingly productive. But, you know, over time, the fatigue has set in. Yeah, uh, and the fatigue of not running into people in the hallway, not having social interactions. You know, if I want to talk to somebody, I have to arrange a Zoom or a Teams call with them now, where I used to just walk over to their desk and spend 30 seconds and, and then leave. And now I have to schedule it. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's, just, it, it's a different thing. And I don't think it's sustainable. The other thing is, uh, you know, when you're hiring people, that doesn't really work that well. I don't like hiring people and then never actually meeting them face to face. Or, yeah. or working with them for months and months and months, and you know, you still not, have never actually met them. So I think that we probably could do more work from home than we used to, but I, I think companies will have a very difficult time uh, sustaining the high level of work from home we've been doing during the COVID period. I just think it's unhealthy, actually, yeah. for uh, work cultures. Well, so as, as the CEO of PTC, are you planning on making any uh, changes as a result of COVID, whether it's around workplace flexibility or anything like that? Yeah, for sure. Um, we had a, a official policy pre-COVID that uh, employees could work from home one day a week. And uh, we're probably going to change that to three days a week. And then we're going to revisit our real estate. Now, mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to get rid of offices, you know, headquarters and, and regional headquarters and so forth. Um, but I think we'll try to set them up differently. And uh, we might need less space because, uh, you know, if you use hoteling and open office concepts, uh, then you can size the office, not to the employee base, but to how many employees you expect to be there in a given day. And I think that, uh, you know, if people work from home half the time, well, basically you need, you know, half the space or perhaps a little more. But but I think we're going to definitely try to optimize the layout and the quantity of square footage we have in our offices and give people more flexibility to to move back and forth. But it doesn't sound like you think offices are going to disappear. I don't think so because uh, I don't know about you. I actually miss the office. I have a perfect, said, everybody I talk to says that. Yeah, I have a perfectly nice office at home. I miss the people. I miss the people I work with, and uh, and I miss socializing with them and interacting and collaborating and all the little stuff that, like I said, happens in thirty seconds doesn't happen anymore, hmm. and uh, and it's frustrating. You know, the laughing and the joke making and so forth. It doesn't ha doesn't really happen over Zoom calls. They're way too structured and in uh, pre-plan to accommodate yeah. that. Have you found that your leadership has changed at all in a virtual remote world? I mean, how are you, you said you're the the, the vision guy, you know, you, you can get your, your, your dreams, your, all these things across to your people. And I would imagine it's very different to do it behind a screen than when you're kind of in a room with everybody and you can kind of present and share ideas. So has your leadership, your communication style changed oh, at all? Sure. Well, let me tell you, I'm like the biggest whiteboard guy you ever saw. <laughs> and uh, that really doesn't work in a Zoom call, yeah. um, you know, Zoom, Teams, WebEx, whatever you want to, whatever you want to go with. And yeah, they might even have a function for that, but it's just yeah, it's not the same. On it's a... not the same, you know. Nobody can see what you're writing, and and uh, you got all the people, and the only way you can see the screen is to get rid of the people. Now you can't see the people, and and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a classic example of something I hate about Zoom calls is I just don't yeah. have a whiteboard, and I I I was that guy who would you know many, many, many meetings would jump up and start start collaborating, brainstorming, actually visually on the whiteboard. And I can't do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, well, I know we just have a couple minutes left. So last few questions for you before we wrap up. Uh, first one is, can you think of a, a moment or a situation that most impacted or influenced your career or your, your approach to leadership? Um, yeah, I mean... Uh, <laughs> This is this is kind of a, a funny one, but or, or a weird one perhaps. But uh, when I graduated from college, I was actually a very shy guy, and and I'm pleased that you said I seem relaxed now because uh, I was actually very very shy, and uh, I wasn't the kind of person who would stand in front of the group and say, "Here's what I think. Uh, here's what I think we should do. You know, here's my argumentation for it." I knew all that stuff, but I I just couldn't get it to come out. 
And I remember uh, the boss uh, scheduled me to give a presentation to a, just an internal group. And I was so intimidated and, uh, you know, just spent the whole night before, like, what am I going to say? How, how am I going to? And then finally I said, you know, uh, I'm asked to do this because I'm talking about something that I figured out and the audience hasn't figured it out. And I'm being asked to explain to them what I have figured out. So why should I be worried about it? You know, mm -hmm. frankly, they're the ones who are, you know, needing this information. I'm asked to give it to them because yeah. I somehow figured it out. So anyway, I just like built up my confidence and, uh, you know, the presentation went just fine and uh, I was never nervous again. And, and then I take that into other aspects of leadership, you know, maybe just be confident in yourself uh, because that was my problem is that I, I thought somebody would laugh at me or, or ask a zinger question I couldn't answer or something like that. And, uh, and, and really after mastering it, that one uh, perilous moment there, uh, ever since then, I told myself, you have nothing to worry about. Just be confident in uh, what you know and what you think. And you're not always right, but but don't be afraid to express it. And I think I really emerged as a leader then because uh, I went from that shy guy who's smart but can't talk to uh, really somebody who can kind of light up a room and uh, develop some followership to go drive an initiative forward. And uh, mm -hmm. that was just an incredible moment in my uh, in my career. I love that story. That's an awesome one. And it actually transitions well into the next question I was going to ask you, which is, for leaders, uh, those who are in a position where they are responsible for other people, um, what's the best piece or the one piece of advice that you would give them to become better leaders? Something that perhaps you've practiced that made you a better leader? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think it really comes back to the idea of uh, followership. I, I mentioned that word. But, uh, you know, a leader and a manager are uh, two different things. To me, a, a manager has given some authority or some remit uh, and they can use that as they need. But a leader, there's no such thing as a leader without a follower. You know, like one yeah. person can't play really follow the leader because there's no followers and therefore there's no leader. So I, I think that the best leaders that I've worked with and, and the ones I've tried to emulate really um, have this quality of uh, convincing people to follow them, to, to support their initiative, uh, to pony up the resources, to... Uh, do what it believe basically. Uh, and yeah. they spend some time, you know, trying to sell their ideas and so forth, but, but they're very careful with the whip, so to say, because uh, that does not create followers that creates people who despise you. And so um, I think, you know, like at, at PTC, um, when I wanted to lead the company into uh, IOT and to AR, I wrote all my ideas down and, and went so far as to get them published in Harvard business review with uh, in collaboration with the famous professor, Michael Porter. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, people read that and they said, wow, that's incredible. And, it, and actually it's good enough that you got published in this, uh, very famous business magazine. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like what you have to say. I mean, tell me more, Jim, um, because I'm, I'm very intrigued by your ability to think this stuff through and articulate it and so forth. And that's just one example of, of how to do it. But, uh, passion is another. Uh, you maybe get some sense from me. I'm I'm very passionate about things I really do care about. Uh, I care deeply and I, I get a little bit emotional, usually in a good way. Um, but, you know, people say, wow, he really believes this. He's not just saying it. He believes it. And and yeah. because he believes it so deeply, I believe it a little bit more than I did five minutes ago. Right. So I think uh, I think it's really that whole concept of develop followers who you know want to help you take the hill whether whether you demand they do or not. They want to help you because they believe. Yeah, and there's a big difference between just saying something versus saying it and believing it at the same time. So I definitely get that from you. I can I can see the passion in there uh, behind all these things that you're talking about. Uh, well, we are at the top of the hour. So Jim, why don't you let everybody know where can they learn more about you or PTC? Anything that you want to mention for people to check out, please feel free to do so. Uh, well, you know, the best uh, the best place uh, to learn about PTC, of course, is our website, ptc.com. It's pretty simple. Um, you know, if you want to if you uh, want to learn more about me and my ways of thinking, um, either uh, Google up these Harvard Business Review articles uh, that I've written, really uh, three of them now with Professor Porter on IoT and AR and things related to that. Um, and then, uh, you know, go on YouTube and you can watch. Uh, I've given many keynote addresses uh, over the years and usually do a good job of trying to lay out the vision as I see it at the moment, you know, and 
evolves over time. But uh, those are great places too to to see how I think and how I talk and maybe see some of the passion that I uh, that I try to bring to work every day. So that's what I'd recommend. Very cool. Yeah, you're pretty easy to find uh, by a Google search, so not too bad. Well, Jim, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak with me. I really appreciate it. All right, great. Thank you, Jacob. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Again, my guest has been Jim Heppelman, CEO of PTC. I highly recommend you Google him, check out some of his work. You will not be disappointed, and I will see all of you next time.